Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, and welcome to, I would say, almost our penultimate session of the annual meeting in 2022. Um, if we can move to the next slide, Julie, um, just a reminder of our code of engagement for the meeting. I'm sure you've heard it a number of times in the meeting, but if you haven't, you can check your participant pack. I'm going to say a little bit to introduce myself, the speakers and the sessions. If we move to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll kick that off. Okay, so I'm Camilla Jones, one of the two co-coordinators of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Um, I'm stepping in today with my colleague Elspeth Chapman, our Strategic Partnerships and Advocacy Specialist to facilitate this session. On behalf of Hani Mansourian, our other co-coordinator who sadly can't be here today, but he did um, work to bring the session together before he, he became unwell. And I'm sure he's uh, really sad to miss this session, especially as it focuses on prevention, which is one of his favorite areas of our, our strategy. So today we're gonna to be talking about working across sectors and prevention. And we've got three um, fabulous, uh, sort of mini mini presentations within the session uh, to bring to you today. Uh, the first is how the World Bank is considering child protection in its COVID-19 social protection response. And we have Coco Lamas, who's the child rights campaign manager from the Bank Information Center to share that with us. We then have a presentation um, entitled Sibling Support for Adolescent Girls in Emergencies. Um, and this is from Mercy Corps, and we have uh, Shadrach Stephen, who is the Strategic Learning Manager from Mercy Corps Nigeria, presenting to us. And then the third um, presentation will uh, be a joint presentation from the International Rescue Committee and World Vision. Uh, it focuses on the impact of cash assistance on the protection and well-being of children and adolescents. And we have case studies from Ethiopia and Somalia. So joining us from IRC, we have Eleonora Mansi, who's the Child Protection Advisor for our, uh, Technical Advisor for IRC, Ayalu Leges, Assistant Child Youth and Protection and Development Coordinator for IRC um, in Ethiopia, I believe, and Katie Ash, who's Service Design Lead for Y Labs, which is one of IRC's partners in Ethiopia. And then from the World Vision side, we have Paul Awara, Technical Specialist for World Vision Somalia, and Mirette Bagat, Child Protection Technical Specialist for World Vision Canada. So we've got quite a team today, and I'm sure it's going to be a really exciting session. Uh, we'll start off with uh, some short presentations from each, and then we'll move into a few uh, questions that we uh, will go through with you all as a sort of panel discussion. But we're really, really keen to answer your questions today. So we do encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. Uh, it might be that some of them get responded to via the chat as the other people are presenting, but we can also um, bring them out in, in the kind of verbal Q&A that we have uh, before we end as well. So, yes, I think that's all that I wanted to say by means of introduction. Um, I'm going to not uh, spend any further time introducing. I'm going to hand over to Coco Lamas for our first uh, presentation. Thank you. The floor is yours, Coco. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Camilla um, and Elspeth, uh, for opening up, up the floor and um, organizing today's session. Um, really excited to be able to be here to, to speak on this kind of issue. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Bank Information Center, we're an organization that monitor how international financial institutions, or IFIs, and multilateral development banks, or MDBs, implement uh, their social and environmental safeguards. We advocate for policy reforms to create meaningful change for project affected communities. Within our child rights campaign, we have started looking more closely at the World Bank's social protection lending specifically, and especially around COVID-19 and the impacts um, around that on children and project affected communities. As some of you may know, in 2020, the World Bank rapidly committed 157 billion US dollars. I'm going to repeat that again, 157 billion to COVID-19 response. That is a sum that my guess we should all believe should have transformative potential. A significant portion of this sum has been dispersed quite quickly through its social protection lending. 
which can be a useful vehicle for the delivery of child protection services. Um, and um, okay, just a reminder to say next slide if you need yeah, to. Yeah, definitely will do. Um, and social protection projects because they're really well positioned to identify and reach those most in need of these services, given that they target the members of society most vulnerable to violence, abuse, and exploitation. Next slide, please. Um, so we're launching a new report this week entitled, How is the World Bank Considering Child Protection in its COVID-19 Response? I'm gonna give a, a brief overview of, of kind of what we looked at um, and some of the key findings. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, BIC conducted an analysis of 55 World Bank COVID-19 social protection projects, which together amount to a total of USD $9.9 billion in social protection lending. Uh, we undertook a mixed methods approach to this analysis, reviewing publicly available uh, project documents on both uh, qualitative and quantitative findings. We looked at how these projects have considered child protection, highlighted a snapshot of some promising practices, and offered recommendations to inform future project design to help strengthen some of the child protection components. We assessed projects on the basis of the project's inclusion of specific elements that we think can contribute to child protection and or child protection system strengthening directly and indirectly. The assessment really focused around five broad categories um, of, of child protection based on what was available in publicly available documents. So one is service delivery. We looked at multi-sectoral collaboration, child friendliness, stakeholder engagement, and uh, you know, data collection, reporting, and disaggregation. These pieces and the data and the findings when taken together can highlight some of the interlinkages of certain social protection project components um, with children at the focus. Next slide, please. The analysis really revealed that overall, child protection measures were really piecemeal and that the bank could benefit from a coordinated strategy on how to integrate child protection and prioritize child protection system strengthening in its COVID-19 social protection projects. The research, we did identify a few promising practices um, and I can highlight a few of those later on um, in today's session that the bank should seek to replicate in other COVID-19 projects or future projects. Um, and they may also be helpful, you know, as others think about designing projects. And however, it's really vital that both the, the bank both recognize that child protection, it's, it should really be a core element of social protection. And there's really a need to develop sort of a coordinated approach and strategy within these. Um, so, you know, I'll just highlight a few of the, 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 you know, snapshot here that we pulled out, you know, of the 55 projects that we looked at, only two of them included child rights organizations in child protection system strengthening, which is, it's not great. Um, but on the other hand, you know, 84% of projects or 46 did include measures around stakeholder engagement plans that consulted with women and or children. So, you know, overall, the findings are really piecemeal. Um, but what we found is that there's really a lack of a coordinated strategy. Next slide, please. So based on these findings in the analysis, we offer five recommendations that we think the bank should take immediately to help strengthen some of the project components around child protection in its COVID-19 social protection lending. One, utilize promising practices identified in this research and other projects that feature strong child protection elements and seek to replicate these practices in current and future projects, encouraging greater institutional learning. Two, develop a coordinated strategy around child protection um, within their social protection mandate based on best practices and provide bank staff with appropriate technical guidance and adequate resources on how to implement this child protection strategy. Three, recognize and build on child protection as a core element of social protection so that these projects can mainstream some components. Four, assess project design and implementation of child protection criteria, including these five categories that we looked at um, throughout the research, but there may also be others as well that are important to take into consideration. And then five, where strong child protection components exist, please deliver on them in implementation. Again, we looked at publicly available documents and how these projects were designed, not how they're implemented on the ground. Um, so policy and practice can be quite different there. 
Specifically, we really call out a number of short, medium, and long-term actions that we think the bank can take to step up and help change the trajectory of COVID-19's impact on the world's most marginalized children. Social protection projects are the bank's best avenue to improve child protection systems in crises, and if utilized properly, can help create a post-COVID-19 world that protects children and gives them the chance to thrive. Broadly speaking, if the goal of social protection projects is to protect protect those members of society most vulnerable to instability and catastrophic shocks, children should be central to this effort. I will leave it at there for now. I look forward to the discussion and I will be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Coco. That was very, um, I'm, I'm dying to ask you more questions because it's just so interesting to share such a big project with such huge potential and um, also to just, you know, imagine how many dimensions there are of, of what you looked into. So I'm glad that we have you on the line for this longer Q&A as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to pass the floor now to Shadrach Stephen from Mercy Corps Nigeria for his presentation. Thank you, Shadrach. Hi, Camilla. Hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're joining from. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to talk about the CSH uh, project, um, which was uh, uh, findings from a CSH project we implemented in Northeast Nigeria. Um, next slide. Um, so prior to implementation of this project, um, in our previous interventions, working with children, adolescents, we've been able to identify some issues, including interpersonal violence, um, cycles of intimate partner violence, violence against children, and then sibling violence. Um, this often overlap within the same households. Um, also, one of the things that we did, having found this, was to see how we can develop a gender transformative family support uh, programming, uh, which was what gave rise to CSH, working with the Women Refugee Commission and then Washington University as their research partner. Next slide. Um, now, what were we trying to do? We were trying to prevent um, violence against girls and to be able to improve their protection um, in a humanitarian setting. Um, this was a pilot uh, in 2020. Uh, we implement, we're currently implementing the same program in Jordan and then Niger uh, with lessons from Nigeria informing the design in Jordan and Niger. Um, some of the things that we've done prior to uh, implementation of this project is we designed uh, a curriculum for the four different targets that we worked with, adolescent girls, male siblings, male caregivers, male caregivers, and then we're having um, synchronized uh, uh, sessions that were delivered every week for 12 weeks, which is uh, three months. Next slide. Uh, now, looking at the context, um, it's a humanitarian context. For those who know not, it's Nigeria. It's been affected by the insurgents for, I think this should be the 13th year now, uh, or 12th year, going into the 13th year. Um, because of COVID, we targeted just 120 households, which means because we have adolescent girls, adolescent boys, uh, or male siblings, as we like to call them, and then male and female caregivers, we had 480 direct participants, four from each of the 120 households. Um, now we recruited male and female caregivers, as well as the adolescent uh, girls and the male siblings, like I mentioned. These were four distinct groups. They were meeting every week uh, with a trained mentor. Um, to discuss topics that had been designed and then reviewed by the community to ensure that it was aligned uh, with customs, culture, and then appropriate for targets. Um, one of the things that we did was to factor in COVID-19. So we're able to adapt, ensuring that we reduce the number of participants. Like I mentioned, we're able to reach only 120 households, and this was because of COVID-19. Um, so in a group, we're having a maximum of eight persons. Uh, because we didn't want the group to be uh, wanted to comply with government regulations and we didn't uh, wanted to reduce as much as possible uh, exposure to COVID. Of course, we provided all the necessary, we abided by all the guidelines, providing face masks, uh, ensuring two meters apart, and then the likes. Next slide. Um, now, in terms of the evaluation, what we did, what did we do? Because there were two distinct groups, we decided to group them into the caregivers and then the uh, adolescents, both boys and girls. Um, with the caregivers, we did um, in-depth interviews and then FGDs. Um, for the adolescents, um, 
one of the things we did is we did peer interviews, we did participatory research activities with these adolescents, and in some cases, we also did FGDs with them. Um, we also did key informant interview with program facilitators. These are trained mentors, like I mentioned, who were facilitating the weekly sessions. Of course, there were interviews also with um, Mercy Corps and WRC staff um, who were leading and implemented this program directly. Next slide. Now, findings. Um, findings which were um, um, peace meals. Like I said, this was a pilot, but uh, of course, the learnings from this program has informed Design Niger Jordan. And um, one of the things that came out strongly was that they were dec there was a decrease in tolerance for um, perpetration of violence against girls and children especially within the households where this program was implemented. Uh, we also found that there was, uh, there was strengthened functioning uh, within participating households. So households that participated, there was uh, strong uh, functioning within those households. Then there was also improved pathways to communication. Communication really improved between father, daughter, um, mother, daughter, mother, son, and then husband and wife in Northeast Nigeria, a context where we're working. Um, siblings interaction, and then of course, reduce violence, which was our ultimate aim. Uh, it came out uh, from the findings that there was reduced violence in the target households for which this program, for which uh, benefited from this program. Of course, one key thing also that came out was gender roles were changing. You could see boys, uh, male siblings supporting their female um, um, uh, adolescent sisters to be able to carry on some of the house chores. Uh, we have a story of someone uh, who were able to track over time. Her position has changed over time because she's now getting the support of her brother to support with the household chores. Next slide. Um, very quickly, in terms of uh, the challenges, of course, like I mentioned, this was in 2020. Um, there were COVID restrictions, but of course, we were able to adapt appropriately and we were able to implement these programs. Then, of course, some participants reported increased levels of behavioral um, control of the girls. Um, so I will stop here. I'm happy to take questions in the chat box and then um, also during the questions that will be facilitated by our facilitators today. Thank you. Thank you, Shadrach. Could you just um, elaborate on the um, on the program in terms of was it community delivered in the community or was it delivered in schools? I feel like I, I missed that okay. bit. Maybe okay, we so didn't thank, give you enough time. <laughs> thank you so much. So it was implemented in communities. Um, they were responsible for choosing where to meet. Um, including the male caregivers, female caregivers, male siblings, and then the adoles uh, female adolescent girls. Um, so it was in community and not in schools. Our targets were marginalized vulnerable households, especially people who have fled um, from their communities. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so for our third um, presentation, I'm going to hand over to um, Eleonora Mansi from the International Rescue Committee, and she's then gonna hand on to her, her colleagues from World Vision afterwards. Thank you, Eleonora. Sorry, tech challenges. Um, yes, so IRC and World Vision, just a brief introduction. IRC and World Vision are looking at how cash can be included in child protection uh, program intervention to prevent and at the same time mitigate risk of child protection from two very different perspectives. So I'm gonna talk about um, uh, the Ethiopia experience for IRC. Next slide, please. So IRC and its partner decided to like focus on adolescent because globally we know that displaced adolescents are a largely overlooked demographic population. And while cash has proven to be an efficient and dignified way to like um, support people in meeting their basic needs, often, or at least at the start of the project in 2019, cash was not given to adolescents for various factors. One, because there wasn't much guidance on how to involve adolescents safely. Um, and two, uh, because many organizations and many staff were also concerned about the risk of directly giving cash to adolescents. Um, so the IRC in partnership with Youth Development Labs, who had an innovate, a very innovative approach and um, design process that we'll talk later in the Q&A, we decided to really involve adolescents. So we targeted 
um, adolescent 15 plus and their caregiver um, in Ethiopia, particularly in shadow camps, um, where 55% of the population of the camp is below 18 years old. Um, and so really we engaged in a six month period project where we really looked at with adolescent, their caregiver and other stakeholder, how cash could be disbursed? What is the safe way from the amount to how to deliver it? And it was really a participatory project uh, together with the various stakeholders. Um, the only, like, let's say, target, even the target was discussed with the adolescent that decided. So at first, we, the, we had initially said we will target unaccompanied children, but later on we discovered that a lot of children were living with caregivers. And so we decided to explore with them how to directly give cash um, to these adolescents. Um, so I'll stop here and I'll hand over to my colleague, Paul, who in turn had a very different like approach to cash for child protection programming. Um, and we later on go more into the details of this program. Yeah, good afternoon from my location. Good evening and good morning from wherever you are. My name is Paul, like I've been introduced. So for Somalia, uh, context, we also had to take into the fact of using cash in order to enhance protection of uh, children and the, of course, definitely to ensure their well-being. Uh, next slide, please. I will be speaking about the overview of the context, Somalia, where we are situated, Horn of Africa. It's the most difficult place to, to be as a child. And it has been mad with conflict and uh, drought. So that double tragedy of drought and insecurity has led to massive displacement. When you come to numbers, about 2.6 million and also about 2,000 IDPs, uh, similar when you go to education, about 1.8 million children are out of school. Uh, massive displacement with many unaccompanied and several children. Issues like uh, mental health and psychosocial distress exists. Then the uh, gum rates, mom rates, severely malnourished kids are quite there. And so this has exposed kids to children to abuse and exploitation and definitely trafficking for those who are in their adolescent ages. Uh, when you look at uh, Somalia, where it is situated, um, since 1993, that's when we've operated in this location. But from 2015, that's when we began a project funded by Global Affairs Canada. And in it, we've, uh, we placed aside 50 foster families these 50 foster families were there to handle issues of children who are in transit, children such that there will be an interior uh, kind of uh, situation where they are housed and fostered for a particular time. So we, we provided the 60 US dollars in what we call the minimum expenditure budget basket, which is uh, determined by the cash cluster. So for a period of about six months in the year 2021, uh, in this way, our aim was to really check the impact of uh, us providing cash to these foster families to be a safe refuge for children. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next slide too, I just provided an overview. Yes, there was our purpose definitely was to check the post distribution monitoring survey. And here we, we of course looked at, uh, worked together with the tools from different agencies like the post distribution tool uh, from Save the Children, uh, also the Child Protection and Cash Watch Assistance M&E tool. Uh, here we had to do a number of consultancies, one with Canada, with Global Cash and Child Protection teams, and also worked together with the caseworkers to be able to conduct this study with, with a number of DM and staff from the agency. Of course, we were looking at a number of things, the spending patterns. We were trying to look at early marriage, uh, education, child labor, uh, children's disability. Uh, we looked at issues of safety, 
and the psychosocial well-being in terms of looking at the coping mechanisms of uh, uh, the children who are on the move, uh, specifically looking at the program quality around the malpurpose cash assistance, accountability and safeguarding. Take me to the next slide. Uh, in this, uh, we, we looked at demographics. Of course, uh, 72% were female uh, participants, then 28 were male. Of course, we looked at a whole range of 26 to 60 year olds because these were the people with a little bit of energy to be able to uh, foster children uh, after they had gone through a good screening uh, to be able to be suitable to work with children. So the findings really came out and we, they were revealing a number of things. We, 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 next slide, please. Yeah, you'll find out that about 24% uh, of children under the age of 18 uh, still got married even after we provided malpurpose cash. Of course, uh, child labor reduced from 10% to 4%. Uh, we also have uh, the relationship between caregivers and children uh, improved much more to about 88%. It's only 10% that revealed that um, the, 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 the relationship were not good. And uh, in this, we had those who had fears, about 52% uh, were afraid about uh, the sustainability of cash programming. Uh, of course, but then that or the other time got squared off by those who, who used this particular money for opening up businesses. And so you realize that about 28% of the people got this money and also invested it into business. And of course, they were supposed to produce more and have a good livelihood. 98% uh, used this money to specifically procure food. And the 46% took it to uh, further the education of these children who were both uh, in transit, were unaccompanied and separated, and then those that were within their own households. Of course, others used it for paying debt and the medical uh, services. Uh, this country has been much more of almost a failed state up to 2012, and the they are depending on the mercy of aid agencies. The tax collection is really small. And so there's not so much there. So this cash assistance was very, very important in providing uh, leverage for them to uh, go to the next level. Next, next slide. Yeah, I'd already also spoken about that slide in my mind. So next slide. Yeah, looking at uh, the coping strategy, uh, for prevention and protection, and for these people moving out of uh, uh, dangerous negative coping mechanisms, you find that about 76% uh, of the families uh, said their kids remained solid, who are much more in the age of adolescent and did not marry them off. Previously, I told you about a 24% who got married. So the 76% is a bigger uh, percentage. Uh, we see uh, the number of meals that people you, uh, tried to, to use before. 78% uh, say they reduced on their meals. That was before. So when the cash programming came in, they fell down to about 62%. And then uh, when it comes to those who skipped meals in order to cope, we are about 30%. Uh, after provision of this uh, a cash transfer, they dropped to about 8%, meaning that now people had a little bit of more meals on the table are provided. And the, there are four issues around the nutritional effects of children uh, were reduced because I remember telling you in the beginning about uh, the gum rates, the mom rates as uh, uh, not really good as, as have been measured by UNICEF. So there are those who limited the portions of their food in order to cope with the difficulty that is taking place, we're about 22% at the time of, uh, before, before provided with this uh, malpurpose cash. So when it came to provision, uh, they fell to about 4%. So the whole 18% was slashed off. 
such that these people were able to live normal lives. Of course, before the cash was provided, those who depended on less quality food were about 26%. And so when funds came in, it shot up to about 78%. So they were buying things like milk, which would help uh, children to, to, you know, to improve on their nutritional status because we've been having very, very poor nutritional uh, statistics that comes out of, of many of the findings that we do. So the cash was much more important to help in the nutritional value of these children, therefore, which is going to help them in their own cognitive development as they push on with life later. Of course, it also shows us that there are some people who got assistance uh, pre previously, and so they both in order to survive. So this time we see those who purchased on credit falling to about 8% before, and then now reducing to about 4%. Uh, after the cash was provided. Therefore, what does it tell us? That um, there is a direct relationship between uh, the provision of cash and uh, coping mechanisms, which are positive in nature. Although we will find out later on as people will be providing their questions, we'll be, going, we'll be diving a little bit more deeper into what this study uh, went out to do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul and Eleonora, and uh, of course to Shadrach and Coco as well for your initial setting the scene presentations. We've had uh, a little bit more information from some than others, so um, we might find that in the next round of the questions, uh, we have a little bit more scene setting from, from some, just to kind of top us up a little bit. Um, just to say some of the questions are already uh, popping up into the chat box, which is fantastic. And I see some responses are being made and we can bring in some of those uh, into the, the chat as well um, for everyone to hear, including those who listen to the recording later. I've noticed a couple of uh, kind of key points coming out. Um, obviously, we've been talking about collaboration with other sectors uh, to support prevention of child protection violations. We've been featuring the social protection and GBV sectors. And it'll be really interesting to hear more um, reflections from, from the, the panellists about how we can work with those other sectors in particular to ensure that we achieve our prevention goal. Um, We've already heard also about some of the outcomes of those projects on children's protection, um, reduced early marriage, reduced child labour, um, reduced family violence. Um, so that's really encouraging to hear. We often don't have kind of clear data that comes out to, to really demonstrate that kind of change. And I think that really shows the value of working across sectors. Um, and we've also heard some other sort of do no harm and accountability considerations regarding targeting and design and also regarding um, evaluation. You know, it's not often that we see such strong evaluation uh, techniques such as post distribution monitoring and the clear data coming out of those. So it's, it's really great to hear this level of um, rich data being presented. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague Elspeth to share the first round of questions with the panelists. Thank you so much for, for sharing such um, uh, great information about the various interventions. And it's already so clear how they touch on so many areas of the Alliance strategy. But before we dump, jump into the, the questions more related to the actual priorities, um, I would just like to move to the next slide and take a flash, uh, take a take a step back and look at the overarching goal. So, as you know, the overarching goal of the strategy, uh, it's bold and it's ambitious, and it's that that the children and their protection are recognised and prioritised as essential and life saving. Uh, so, I've heard some great examples already, but it would be great if you can just give a very brief um, um, sort of snapshot of how you think this is reflected in your in your um or how it applies to your to your project or to your program um and if there's been a specific challenge or or area that could be strengthened um and i think i'm just going to hand that firstly to katie um to to answer thank you Great. 
Um, so one of the things that we did in the design of the Tagiro Cash project, um, which was targeted um, in the Shutter camp in the Somali region of Ethiopia, um, about 56% of the population is below 18 years old. Um, and we worked really closely in partnership with young people. Um, we had some uh, young people from the camp environment join our team um, and work with us in the design of the intervention. Um, and in designing the cash program that we ultimately came up with, we really mapped out the whole universe of children um, within this environment, understanding how cash introduced into this setting would introduce, like, uh, intervene in everything from self-concept all the way to how it might um, lead to um, impact on their really big dreams that they had um, for themselves. Um, you know, many of the young people within the camp environment still had very um, ambitious desires. And so we designed the program to um, both mitigate the risks that they experience in all these different spheres, um, but to also bolster, um, you know, their self-confidence and their ambitions um, for tracking towards a healthy future. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much. That was really, that was um, a great answer and it's really, um, yeah, it's really interesting to see that you have this um, participatory approach and children are really involved in the design. Um, and I also really like that you're not just looking at the different sectors that it that affects them, but also looking at ambition and aspirations. And I, I think there's a lot to learn from this. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I think the next person we're going to ask this question to, so I'm just looking at the plan is um, Paul, please, from World Vision. Can you please um, reflect on, on your program? Thanks. Come again. I didn't hear you well. Yes. Could you just tell us a bit about how the Alliance's goal of the centrality of children and their protection applies to, to the project that you presented? Yeah. Uh, looking at the centrality of children and their protection, uh, because like in, 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 in the beginning, when I was talking about uh, the context, we have drought and conflict and climate shocks. So these ones have definitely affected livelihoods, children and families in this location. However, a number of things were done. First of all, uh, looking at, uh, we've got the International Organization for Migration, which manages the protection and return monitoring network, uh, which indicated that between January and August 2020, we had about 890,000 displaced people. And of course, 54,000 came to the location where this project is located. And the, about 15% of those were unaccompanied and separated children are uh, exposed to the various uh, abuse, exploitation in the camps and in the host communities. However, because of the, the foster family uh, approach, uh, many of these kids were into that temporary uh, interim care as they waited to, for family tracing and reunification. There is just one uh, positive uh, thing about the culture here is that uh, people are divided into five clans, then subclans. If someone just hears that is from a certain clan, they just take them in, uh, even without uh, asking many questions. However, so the foster families decided to take in uh, these children for the best interest of the child. And then from there, of course, they had to have some fixed in school, uh, paid their fees, provided water, shelter, medical care and clothing, you know? So that the giving shelter to these kids and uh, providing for them an avenue to stay uh, was a good uh, uh, measure in, of course, uh, preventing them from uh, indulging into negative coping mechanisms. Therefore, the issue, the centrality of children and their protection there 
uh, is definitely uh, enhanced. Thank you so much. Thank you for that answer. Definitely. It's really clear now across all of these interventions that the most the, the more children are in the center, the more sectors are involved and the, the more support they receive through livelihoods, through education, through shelter. So thank you so much. So passing the floor now to Coco, you mentioned a little bit that the inclusion of children in the uh, World Bank social protection mechanisms was piecemeal. So reflecting on this on this question, I'd really like to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thanks, El Elspeth. Yeah, um, sure thing. So one of the overarching questions we really aim to explore was how some of these World Bank COVID-19 social protection projects actually considered children, right? And as you noted as well, that, you know, that this quote unquote considered approach was actually quite piecemeal. Often children, if they were mentioned, they're considered as beneficiaries or as a vulnerable group. And that doesn't necessarily mean that children and their protection is recognized as like essential and life-saving across projects. So while about half the projects we looked at included child protection as a component, the remainder did very little to identify and address the needs of children in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic or the surrounding circumstances. And um, one of the other avenues we actually looked at uh, was how child-friendly some of the, the social protection project components are. Um, and if they're designed in a way to enable children to understand and access project benefits, as well as obtain redress if they're harmed by the project. Um, part of this includes stakeholder engagement um, and whether or not projects consulted with children. Um, another aspect is whether or not projects were designed in an accessible manner. And we found that some things were good. So for example, 69% of the projects we looked at provided referral pathways in their grievance redress mechanisms for violence against children and other child protection complaints. And 84% included measures in their stakeholder engagement plans that were accessible to women and children. But on the other hand, only 42% of projects mentioned child-friendly consultation measures um, and only 20% included a child-friendly grievance redress mechanism. So. Again, given that social protection projects target the members of society most vulnerable to exploitation abuse like children, um, you know, the centrality of children piece is, is definitely missing and it, 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 isn't, it is there, but again, piecemeal. And so a lot can be done to help strengthen that. And we think that a coordinated strategy across uh, the social protection theme would really uh, help bolster that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's great to see it, see such a clear um, recommendation coming from this study. Um, so I think last uh, on this for this question, um, Shadrach, please could you uh, speak a little bit to this question? Thank you. OK, um, thank you so much. Um, permit me to shed more light on the context. Um, in 2021, we're about to start. Um, we've received statistics that about 2.5 million um, persons were in need of protection services uh, in Northeast Nigeria, three states in Northeast, Borno, Adama, and Yube. Uh, majority of these were children and then women. Um, we are working in a context, like I mentioned, that has been ravaged by insurgency for years. And um, of course, we know that um, girls, uh, our primary target, like I, I mentioned that we targeted 120 households, our primary target were girls. What did we wanted to do? We wanted to ensure that um, we reduce their vulnerabilities to violence, but that we build their resilience and then break uh, uh, intergenerational cycle of harmful norms. Uh, of course, we know that girls already, uh, they live in a vulnerable state, sexual violence, early forced marriage, and the issues even become compounded in a humanitarian setting. Um, so what we did was that we, we designed with them, we planned with them right from the beginning. They were at the center of this implementation. We were targeting four people from the households, but the centrality of this were really, really children, made mostly the girls wanted to see how girls could be supported, how violence could reduce, especially knowing fully that um, most of these people were people who have fled their uh, locations. They are now either IDPs or people who have returned to their location who is now at peace. So really, uh, we work with them, work with community leaders, work with community structures to ensure uh, these ones are protected, children most especially are protected from violence, from harm. And then um, we reduce that, uh, cycle of harmful norms, especially against uh, girls. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you ever so much. 
Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Camilla for our next set of questions, which are going to delve a little bit more into prevention. Um, so I'll hand over to Camilla. Thank you, Elspeth. It was uh, yeah, great to hear how children are being put at the centre of these programmes from the design and also now in, in some of the reflections on the ways forward on how they need to be put at the centre. Um, if we move uh, to the next slide, I'd like to ask uh, the panellists to think about what key elements of prevention they can highlight under these projects. We're getting to the real meat of our, of our session today and it's focused on prevention. So I'm gonna move first to International Rescue Committee, um, Ethiopia. So I think Miret or, um, sorry, Eleanor or Ayalu, I'm not yeah. sure. Ayalu, so passing over to Ayalu to answer this one. Welcome, it's the first time we've heard you, so welcome Ayalu. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Camilla. Uh, I am Ayalu, good afternoon and good morning for everyone. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, the risk of not having money leads uh, adolescents unaccompanied and separated children uh, to neg ne negative coping mechanisms. Uh, uh, from our experience of working in this camp, as well as from the focus group discussion during the design stage, we learned that uh, unaccompanied separated children are, uh, feel not comfortable and not, uh, they are feeling uh, inferior because of lack of money. Uh, so, uh, because of these children go to the, to the nearby towns, go out of the camp to bring money uh, for, for home. Uh, because parents, caregivers were not able to meet their basic needs, uh, so they do not send them to school, but they send them to work to the nearby towns such as Bomba and uh, Jijiga, uh, to bring uh, money and uh, contribute to the household consumptions. In these situations, children are uh, ex uh, children are exposed to further harm. Especially girls are exposed to unhealthy domestic court and uh, 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 child marriage. So, through the key inform uh, uh, key informant. Uh, questioner as well as from focus discuss, discussion that uh, we look into uh, the relationship between the adolescents and the caregivers. We look into also the uh, environment where they are living, the risk factors as well as the protective factors at home, in the school, uh, in the community as well as in the working in the in the in the working uh places so uh, this has helped us to uh, develop a plan not to put children for further harm uh, the practical key elements that we used in our implementation during this stage was that we're not providing much money but we provide them only a small amount of money uh, about 500 each for each child so that it will help them uh, for school expenses, as well as it may not also expose them for further harm. And the other thing is that the distributions, the distributions happened in a safe and uh, secured place. It was in out, out of the home in a safe place. And uh, besides that, lists of contact persons of uh, protection in case of emergency is happening, uh, lists of uh, contact persons in the camp was given to beneficiaries as well as to uh, case workers. Uh, uh, this is, uh, please next slide. Yeah, uh, in the preventions, you see uh, key elements. The key elements are uh, the one which I mentioned is that uh, uh, we do not give cash meaning a big amount of cash, but a small cash in hand, mm. uh, so that they are not exposed to risk. And the other thing is that the distribution is in a safe and, and in a protected way. Uh, next slide. 
I think we'll come back um, later, Ayalu, to a few yeah. more more points um, from you. Um, we'll just move to hear from some of the others first. But I think it's been really interesting because you've highlighted both the child protection issues in the context that you were working to prevent and the child protection issues that you thought might arise as a result of the design of the programme and how you put things in place to eliminate those risks. So looking at the sweet spot between, uh, you know, providing not, not enough to make a difference, but not providing too much that the child was seen as a risk. And then also thinking about any risks in the environment when you might distribute the, the cash. So, um, that's really, really helpful. I'm going to pass now to um, Paul from World Vision Somalia to share in response to this question on the key elements of prevention that he can highlight and in his project. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the elements of prevention, uh, first of all, I would say that uh, we did the screening of foster families. Uh, somebody must have been suitable to be able to keep children. So putting a stop gap to anything that would bring about harm to children. Then of course, we they were passed through positive parenting and then from there, they, they took on the skills. However, critical here is the subject of my papa's cash. You know, by meeting the immediate and short-term needs of foster families, uh, plus, the unaccompanied and separated children whom they were keeping, uh, it helped to alleviate some of the economic pressures that uh, were around. You know, since that has been a period of uh, COVID-19 with lockdowns globally, and so even remittances were not coming in. So the malpapas cash helped to shelve uh, issues around prevention such like that the children are safe, uh, the caregivers are safe in terms of uh, uh, the foster families. And so coming from our, our survey that we, 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 we did, uh, the Postbution and Monitoring Survey, of course revealed that uh, providing my past cash to these families decreased the prevalence of uh, negative coping mechanisms. And therefore the element of prevention comes in very handy. Great. So another really holistic way of looking at the prevention in terms of equipping the family with positive parenting, screening for risk factors, but also making sure that you alleviate their economic pressures through the cash uh, intervention. So, yeah, really strong focus on, on prevention. Although there is, there is just one thing that I left out. Uh, OK. <laughs> yes, I, I would say because it just came back to my mind that uh, it should just be understood that uh, there is need to have comprehensive interventions eh, uh, for us to be able to do this uh, uh, prevention, the element of prevention. So this very project uh, selected a number of girls and uh, did uh, provision of school dues and then they provided the menstrual, menstrual hygiene kits to them such that they are protected from all sides, you know, uh, to prevent uh, whatever would uh, come in as a result of either stress or whatever negative coping mechanism. Hmm. Thank you for that addition, Paul. That's really helpful. Um, okay, so I think we're going to now ask this question to Shadrach from Mercy Corps in Nigeria. Um, Shadrach, which prevention approaches did you implement under your project? Okay, thank you, Camila. Um, so for us, um, one of the things we did, first of all, to ensure protection, prevention, was to ensure we get them um, trusted mentors. Um, so we got people from the community um, who were able to get um, approvals and sign off from community leaders to say these are trusted community people. So we started from there, from the people we work with or trust these children in their care. So we started by getting these people who were vouched, uh, who got uh, the nod of community leaders. Uh, another thing we did was we ensured that the curriculum we were using were contextually um, uh, acceptable and then age appropriate, just to ensure that we don't do anything that um, will bring an issue. Um, we facilitated gender transformative um, um, programming 
and probably I'll get to explain what the gender transformation means. Um, we ensured that uh, they were having different sessions. So we had sessions for male caregivers, female caregivers, so different uh, age and target specific interventions were happening synchronously um, every week. Um, we also ensured that the topics were very appropriate um, context specific in such a way that it will um, go a long way in trying to prevent uh, uh, towards prevention uh, topics like gender role socialization, power, violence, um, interpersonal communications, and the likes. So these are some of the measures that we implied and then we implemented right from the design of the program to ensure um, prevention of children uh, throughout the CSAG uh, pilot project in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shadrach. Um... Really interesting to see how you've focused on prevention as well there. Um, we have uh, Coco also keen to respond to this question, I believe, and then I'm gonna hand back to my colleague Elspeth. So Coco, please tell us your um, focus on uh, prevention. Yeah, um, thank you. Much. Thank you. Um, so interesting to hear um, all these prevention components kind of at the, the project level, um, which is great. And one of the things that we were really interested to see kind of in this sort of more macro level was kind of how the World Bank considered um, and included children in service delivery of some of the social protection components kind of in the lens of protection, if that makes sense. So we looked at the hiring of child protection service uh, delivery providers, the provision of psychosocial support for children, um, the integration of, um, you know, child um, focused NGOs and CSOs into the child protection service delivery and how cash transfer programs were being utilized for child protection. What was really interesting actually on the cash transfer question is that of the 24 projects that included a cash plus program, 100% had a potential entry point for child protection concerns, which is amazing. Which, and although this is a positive initial step, unfortunately, when you look at the details, few were really effectively designed. And while there was significant variation in the design of the 24 projects, the overall dearth of child protection elements points towards a lack of consideration for child pr protection in this prevention approach in the design of these cash plus programs. Um, and uh, one other, you know, one promising practice that I'd like to just note was uh, noted in a project in Lebanon which is the Lebanon Emergency Crisis Response Social Safety Net Project. And a large component of this provision uh, includes social services as part of its cash transfer programs. And it includes psychosocial support for children and gender-based violence and sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment survivors. And it, the real goal is to work closely with and even hire civil society organizations to assist with service delivery. So a, a project like that, this that actually has thought about some of the child protection concerns and consideration and then builds in some of these protect prevention components and response components can really help, um, you know, strengthen not just the response in the project, but help kind of the borrower who is often, you know, a government um, to really strengthen their capacity as well. So these are the types of things that we think really could be learned from and replicated um, in future interventions. Thanks. Thank you, Koga. I mean, that's, I feel like it's really music to my ears that you're sharing so frankly about the challenges. It's really what we hoped for this annual meeting, um, to hear these challenges and hear some of these innovative ways that others in the panel are, are um, addressing challenges as well. Um, it sounds to me like, you know, through the prevention work, you're also saying that there needs to be that clear link, purposeful link with response services as well. So, you know, we, we're kind of working holistically while looking at prevention. Um, okay, I'm going to hand to Elspeth to bring us into our next round of, of questions, and then we'll bring in the questions that are coming in from the participants. So please do continue to share those. Thank you very much. And please do, exactly. Please put your questions in the, in the chat box at any time. You don't need to wait until the Q&A segments. And I can see we're getting some great questions already. So actually, uh, a very strong link to prevention. We're now going to look at a little bit um, more into the multi-sector and integrated nature of some of the projects and interventions. So I think it's just so clear that the roots of, of child protection risks are extremely complex and as a result, very multi-sectoral by nature. 
So prevention and preventing harm to children before it happens often requires then a really concerted effort to work with other sectors and to have multi-sector and integrated um, interventions uh, which can support all different facets of a child and their family and their communities' lives in order to prevent these harmful outcomes. So I think moving into this segment, and we start with Ayalu from um, from from IRC, it would be great if you could tell us what other sector or aspects did you integrate into the child protection activities um, that made these projects successful and multi-sectoral collaboration? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, integrated cash uh, component is proven to be uh, an effective way of preventing children, uh, protecting children from harm. Uh, uh, this can be also explained in the program building, in the following program building. One is giving money directly to adolescents. Uh, and uh, uh, in the beginning, or during the design stage, and also during the implementations of this project, uh, the challenge we had from caregivers and from community leaders, as well as from the authorities was that they had a belief that uh, giving money to children is risky and it will make them to develop undesirable behaviors. But after the distribution that we learned that uh, giving money to especially to adolescents age 15 plus one is uh, reducing the negative coping mechanism. And also at the same time, it is also supporting their formal educations. Uh, uh, because of this, so uh, it was accepted. And the other is uh, with financial literacy also was provided for caregivers as well as for uh, uh, adolescents so that it will help them to prioritize their needs and also to manage their finance effectively in a wise way. And the other thing is that communities through long run future uh, success grant. The future success grant is, uh, this is for uh, adolescents or uh, unaccompanied separated children. Uh, uh, there are children who are engaged in small scale uh, business and so the for the future success grant help them to continue and strengthen their uh, uh, small scale business and also for those who want to continue their education higher education in the college uh, this fund will also help them in uh, continuing their education in higher in higher grants and the other component was uh, mentors. Mentors was selected from the local community, from Shader refugee camp, and from the host community. A businessman for those who are interested to continue uh, in business training, and in B, I mean in business, in a small scale, continuing their small business skill training, and also uh, a university student or a graduate for those who want to continue their higher educations. Uh, this was the uh, protections uh, strategies that we used in this project. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. That's really interesting. So I think now on looking at some maybe of the challenges, it would be great to hear from Marette's perspective, um, what were some of the challenges and the lessons learned of integrating child protection in other sectors within the project? Yes, thanks, Elizabeth, and hi, everyone. Um, yeah, just, just adding to Paul, and I think I'm also a big fan of talking about challenges because um, it kind of gives us uh, perspective on what we need to do or learning lessons for uh, the future work. And I think what Paul mentioned uh, around early marriage raised a lot of questions um, because uh, as we saw from the results that Paul shared earlier, there were three out of, I believe, 50 families that still uh, went ahead and um, married their children. Uh, and when asked about the reasons, uh, one of the families uh, mentioned that 
their their uh, girl was already engaged before receiving the cash distribution, so they they went ahead with uh, the marriage after. Um, and I think this raises an important um, thought is that integration should happen really very early from the design phase and not an after thought, not after during implementation where thinking of, okay, how to integrate child protection with uh, cash or with livelihood or with other sectors. I think it has to be really well thought. It has to, uh, as Paul mentioned, it really has to be to address all of the different root causes. So if we're dealing with a specific uh, child protection issue, uh, maybe cash will address the uh, economic aspect and will relieve some of the uh, economic pressure, but then it wouldn't address maybe aspects that has to do with our attitude toward early marriage. Maybe some of the families don't even see uh, early marriage as an issue. They see it as um, a normal uh, practice. So I think it's really important to um, make sure that we're addressing all of the different uh, causes. We're complementing cash uh, here in this uh, project, cash is complemented, as Paul mentioned, with other, with case management, with other, with education, with, but sometimes there is very complicated issues like early marriage, for example, that really has more of complex root issues that cannot just be addressed by one uh, intervention or one activity. We really need to dig deeper. It might actually take years um, to address change in behaviors, for example. So this is some of, uh, I guess, or one of the main challenges we've seen in this uh, in this project. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mirat. And I think it's a message we've actually heard across several sessions this week in the terms of for integration to really be meaningful, it needs to start extremely early on and can't just be something that's added on at a later stage and it needs to really come right from the initial design. So thank you for, for reiterating that really important point. Um, and I think the final question of this segment goes to Coco. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear from you how the World Bank uh, utilizes a multi-sector approach in its COVID-19 response. Thanks, Elspeth. I think that word integration um, is really critical here and an important one to think about. So one of the key elements that we looked at specifically in this analysis of the social protection projects, the COVID-19 projects, was multi-sectoral collaboration because, as we all know, projects that include um, ministries that manage child protection and design and implementation phases are much more likely to consider and address child protection concerns and then also link child protection to other project components where they're appropriate. Um, although most projects did include multiple line ministries when we looked at them, less than a third of the projects met all of the criteria for multi-sectoral collaboration for child protection, indicating that there likely was not a concerted effort to engage these relevant ministries in project design and plans for implementation. So we would say that overall, there's a real urgent need for the banks to promote and facilitate better interagency coordination in its social protection projects. Um, and they can do that by including mechanisms for cross-sectoral collaboration and guidance to utilize these, these mechanisms. And they can also help reduce duplicative work, um, better identify gaps in implementation and provide greater benefits to those who need them most, including children. And, you know, two ideas here are, you know, establishing some sort of interagency coordination mechanisms in social protection projects themselves, or, and or creating linkages between project implementing ministries and other government entities. I did also wanna highlight one promising practice which we found in the Nigeria COVID-19 Action Re uh, Recovery and Economic Stimulus Program, which met all three multi-sectoral collaboration criteria. And this, um, it really provides an example of a strong interagency coordination mechanism. The project has a three-tier formal structure at the federal level, which consists of a steering committee made up of representatives of involved line ministries, a technical committee, and the support unit responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the project. So again, there are some really promising practices that could be replicated um, or kind of um, learned from in, in future projects. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. 
Thank you so much. And do you mind if I just go off piece and ask you a question, which what we hadn't prepped? But I just want to, um, you gave a really interesting example from uh, Lebanon earlier. And I just want to know, did that have a strong multi-sectoral or an integrated element to it as well? So that one did, that Lebanon project actually scored the highest of all of the projects that we looked at. So, you know, in terms of whether or not it considered child protection, quote unquote, um, that one was the strongest. So that one also did include a multi-sectoral approach and there were a number of line ministries involved there. I can't list all of them off uh, right now, but um, it did. So I guess it does speak to the importance of that and um, how um, you know it, it can be considered a stronger project in design. Again, we looked at design, not implementation. So we'll have to see how that plays out um, at, at the project level. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you all, actually, for sharing such great examples of, of challenges, um, of lessons learned and really promising practices. So thank you ever so much. Uh, and I'm now going to hand back to Camilla, who's going to facilitate some of the Q&A. And in the meantime, I really encourage you now to start asking uh, questions to the panelists, either in the chat or if you want to put up your hand and come off mute, please, please uh, do as well. Thank you. Okay, so if we bring down the um, slide, Julie, and then maybe we can spotlight the panellists if they don't mind. So we have a bit of a panel feel. Um, so, yes, I think we've got now um, about three or four questions at least coming in all on early marriage. So I believe we'll share those to um, Paul from World Vision Somalia and perhaps uh, Marette will come in as well. So um, I'll go through them and then you can see uh, how to pick up. So we've got one from Bukena. She's curious to know about the findings um, that are a result of the cash programming that uh, child marriage didn't de decrease while child labour did decrease. Any particular insights from you about this? So to see the correlation there, if it's kind of a glitch in the data or um, there's another dynamic going on there, perhaps males and females are uh, affected differently. Um, and I'll pop these in the chat box once I've summarized them as a reminder to you. So then we also have one from Lean. Can you elaborate on early marriage, economic reasons or family preference? Which of the two is most prominent? Is it primarily a matter of changing social norms or alleviating poverty? Which is a great question as well. And then uh, Saul um, asks, it will be interesting to hear more about the increase in early marriages and what the project did, to really, to, did relative to addressing some of the drivers uh, if it was set up to address these. Um, yes, and then general question from Abdi Kadir, what are the lessons learned on cash programming and its impact on child marriage? So I'll direct that to Paul. And then if any other panelists want to come in, they can pop their hands up. Yes, thank you so much, Camilla. Uh, I think the issue is that uh, Miret mentioned that uh, without addressing uh, the root causes, Malpapas cash alone uh, can fail to prevent all marriages from happening. Yeah, because we were dealing with the pressures, yes, but uh, there was need to bring in other integration issues for us to be able to tackle the issue of child marriage. Uh, the culture, the social norms uh, of the location where the project is addicted that uh, girls are supposed to be married off very quickly. Now, uh, many, I, I would say majority, I cannot give you the exact number of uh, out of school children after the age of 12, uh, there is a fear of the unknown by the parents uh, just to have adolescent girls stay free. Uh, they fear that uh, an accident can happen. Maybe they can get pregnant out of wedlock. So most of the things they do is to marry them off. So it's a cultural issue. Uh, it's a societal issue because uh, one, we've been in a situation of, uh, we have just come back to semblance of normalcy from around 2012. So many of the things are, society is still grappling with, especially around security. So it's better for a girl to be married off at that time. Now, 
This is a society that does uh, female genital mutilation or cutting. So the issue is that that is a rite of passage. And the, when a girl has been uh, subjected to female genital mutilation and is already an adolescent, she's already considered someone who, because it's a rite of passage, you are living childhood into adulthood. So they are ready for marriage. So now these are things, uh, characters, cultures that have lived on for about 2000 years. Uh, a project of about three years or four years uh, is not good enough to, to do this. What have we done? We've, uh, there, is, there, there is an innovative model called uh, Channels of Hope where World Vision utilizes faith leaders into dealing with social norms. So there are quite a number of things. They do what we call T-talk, men to men, men to boys. They are the ones who want to marry circumcised girls and therefore they marry them very young. So these are talks that are already on. Men in the evenings take tea and talk to one another. Uh, it's part of the project that, that is being done. Plus something that uh, the Ministry of Faith, Religious Affairs is just about to approve where uh, the Channels of Hope program is going to take on this issue of uh, child marriage uh, into what we dub the, what we had really chosen as it takes the world to uh, end violence against children. It, so it's something that we are already uh, moving on uh, to see that at the end of the day, we reduce the number of uh, girls who get married. Of course, like I already said, because someone had asked, what are you doing? I, I saw on the, on, the, on, on, the, on, on the chat here, what has the project done? Like I said, pro provision of menstrual hygiene kits to ensure girls remain in school. And uh, of course, that has been a plus to some of them who have remained. Then the life skills, life skill uh, program within the project has, has already spoken to a, a number of adolescents and some of them have agreed to push forward uh, the time they will get married. And they have joined the community health workers to be able to, to speak about against child marriage because we have got many cases of fistula. Fistula is a, is a health condition where someone passes out uh, urine continuously because uh, the person was hurt in, uh, by the time she was giving birth when she was not ready. So girls have been told to delay marriage saying so that their bodies are able to deliver a baby. So those and many others are the things that the project has done. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think that's a really comprehensive answer and it is challenging sometimes to talk about social norms in, in that level of detail, but I think you've helped us to get quite strong insight into a complex culture in your short intervention. Certainly from my experience working with Somali refugees, I know the women can also play a role in um, encouraging uh, female genital cutting um, so it's you know perpetuated at many levels but it was very interesting that you pointed out that keeping the girls occupied through the life skills can help to delay the early marriage as well so kind of more prevention elements being picked up here that weren't necessarily scripted I wonder if now there was a question for Shadrach um, as well in the chat and Shadrach was going to tell us a little bit about what gender transformative means to him. So maybe he can mention that as I think it links a little bit to Paul was sort of bringing us towards gender transformation recommendations. And Paul, uh, Shadrach, you could perhaps also answer the question of were all members of a household engaged to attend the sessions or only a few? So a little bit more about the methodology of how you worked in your specific project. I'll pop that on the chat. Thank you so much, Camila. Uh, so I'll start with the second question. If all members of the household, so um, because this was a pilot, um, we had a number per household, so it was four. So in a household, we'll pick a male caregiver who is not necessarily the father. It could be the eld, it could be an uncle, it could be the eldest person. So whoever serves as the male caregiver, then there was a female caregiver. Our primary target was an adolescent girl between the ages of 10, 14, then a male sibling who is not necessarily a biological um, blood brother. Um, so four people within the households that were having sessions separately based on a day and time that they agreed in their own groups. Um, these groups uh, were ensured that they were um, 
sex disaggregated, they were age disaggregated, and even language. Some of them spoke the local, uh, the Hausa language, some of them Kanuri, which is so we ensured that the group were arranged in such a way that it became easy for everybody to really uh, participate and then um, for easy assimilation within the group. Um, now, regarding the question on um, gender transformation, what we did was we were trying to work with the participants and the communities in our own little thinking. Like I mentioned, WRC designed um, this project together with learnings from what Marsico has done in the past in Northeast Nigeria. We came up with this and then uh, we wanted to challenge the gender and societal norms that were affecting um, uh, not is Nigeria, especially people in humanitarian emergencies, and wanted to address issues of uh, inequalities, issues of violence, uh, especially targeted at girls, and then by extension, women and other people within the society. Um, so this is what we did, working with different uh, participants and then, of course, stakeholders, relevant stakeholders to be able to achieve this. Um, I don't know if I answered all the questions. We're running out of time, so I think we're actually just debating uh, <laughs> which other questions we can ask to the group. But I think uh, if you didn't answer it, I'll ask the, the, the questioner to pop another question in the chat box to you. And I'm going to hand to Elspeth to make an executive decision <laughs> on the remaining question to ask. Um, uh, I think sorry, there are a couple a little bit similar, so we can try to combine them. Um, but there was a question around top child protection issues and concerns addressed through a cash program um, and the positive and negative impacts uh, of cash and whether this was a sustainable solution for families and these risks that they were facing. So, so let's sure. have panellists pop their hands up if they'd like to respond to those and maybe Elspeth, you can pop them in the chat just to allow the panelists to be clear on them. I saw Eleanor nodding. I think Ayale or Katie would be in a better position okay. to answer if they can. All right. Should yeah, I'm happy to take this one. All right, and then we'll pass to Ali. Um, so one of the uh, biggest risks uh, that we identified through working with the um, children within the Shutter camp environment was that a lot of young people were in um, unsafe work environments um, because we were working with unaccompanied and separated children. Um, oftentimes they are forced to leave school uh, much earlier than a lot of the other children. Um, and school is really the safest environment for young people um, it, within the camp um, and also uh, the strongest pathway, at least perceived, um, at gaining future success. Um, so a lot of the both mitigating risk, um, which the biggest risk that we saw that they were immediately experiencing um, was not having to drop out of school um, uh, and participate in unsafe work environments in nearby uh, towns. Um, uh, and we really saw the uh, school dropout rate um, plummet during the cash intervention time, which was really um, amazing to see. Um, and then, of course, one of the other major risks that we're all, always worried about creating um, during a cash program is any kind of unsettling of the home environment and shifting in power dynamics within that context. Um, so we had to make sure that um, there was education for the young people, but also the caregivers about the program and its intentions, um, as well as cash um, for the caregivers as well. Thank you, Katie. Ayali, did you want to add anything? To okay, Katie thank said? you. Let me add also the major concern in the in Shadow Refugee Camp was that because of a uh, lack of money or cash, uh, and accompanied separated children, especially go to the nearby town where they exposed to further harm for trafficking, for child labor, many, many. Uh, uh, challenges and many, many risks are uh, they face. Uh, 
uh, and this uh, uh, the cash programming according to the post uh, distribution uh, assessment conducted a uh, month after the uh, future distribution shows that uh, the this program the project uh, has improved uh, because many children as uh, Katie mentioned has come back and rejoined schooling uh, so this cash programming has helped one of the other thing was that uh, because of a shortage of many in the camp uh, caregivers arrange a child marriage also uh, children at the age of 14 13 they got married uh, in order uh, the family also or the child to get, I mean, support or for their livelihood. So this has also harmed it uh, because they are not going to the school. So all these things, uh, the project has supported and improved the situations according to the uh, post uh, distribution assessment. For this, I think the most important thing is that the involvement of the, the community starting from the design stage, the co design stage. There was awareness raising, aware and coffee discussion, as well as panel discussion on the importance of the project also, and how they can support uh, their future uh their future goal because the children have their own goal so in this case the project has contributed a great deal thank you thank you so much thank you that was a that was a very comprehensive answer so just mindful of time it, it's unfortunate that we're not able to get to all of the questions um in the chat but we do save the chat and the recording and we will be able to reflect upon the questions that were asked in our in our own post annual meeting reflections and learnings um, and i can see there are lots of requests uh, to share the reports documents evaluations etc so we can liaise with the panelists and we can if they're available we can share these as well on the um, resource page for for the in the philo space for the annual meeting um, so I, with that, I think it's really a great session to highlight in order how, to, in, if we want to really make progress towards our overall goal of the centrality of children and their protection, how all the different elements, whether it's accountability, um, especially child participation, prevention, multi-sector and integrated programming, localization, the role of local communities. I think it's so clear from this really rich discussion how interlinked they are and how they're all really needed in order to contribute to this goal. So thank you so much for sharing with us your learnings and your challenges. Um, and with that, we have, I'd uh, just like to remind you now that um, we've, we have a survey monkey, a, a, um, a feedback form for every session. So the link is in the chat box. This is really important for our own um, learning purposes. So please do um, provide feedback in the form. Um, and we will now have uh, infographics in the infographic room. So we can um, you can go and you can find the, the room in Philo space and you can um, see some infographics from some other colleagues and learn about some programs that they're implementing. Uh, and then we'll be meeting back in plenary um, at half past the hour. So 4.30 Central European summertime for our closing session and reflections. And we really encourage you all to be there because this is where you can really feed back to us your learnings from, from the last uh, few days. So thank you ever so much to our panelists and speakers, facilitators and producers and to all of the participants that are here today. <laughs>